Now we are excited to have on The Endless Hustle, former 16-year NBA veteran turned cannabis entrepreneur and mogul, Mr. Al Harrington. How are you, Al? I'm good, man. How y'all doing today? Good. Good. How's uh, the pandemic treating you? I kind of missed the pandemic, like having to stay in the house. That was kind of a cool time, like really spending in the house with the family and all that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, pandemic has been uh, definitely up and down. But uh, for me, it's a lot of positives. You know, like I said, be able to spend that quality time with the family that you know I had been doing just because I've been running around so much, running the business, and also it gave me an opportunity to kind of sit back and really watch my business and you know realize some of the things that we could be doing better and stuff like that. So definitely took advantage of this time. Let's kick it off by talking about your company Viola, which is, if I'm not mistaken, one of three cannabis companies under the Harrington Group. What was the impetus for getting into that industry, and did you have any hesitation? Uh, given the stigma, especially five years ago? Of course, I mean, <laughs> I was scared, right? A little, little scared, but nah. you know, being that you know, I was able to convince my 79-year-old grandmother at the time to try cannabis to deal with her glaucoma pain, and it worked for her, you know what I'm saying? And she went downstairs, and when I went to go check on her, she was downstairs crying, uh, you know, reading her Bible. And uh, you know, at that moment, it, you know, the way I felt about cannabis changed forever. You know, because I was always taught that it was a gateway drug and all these different things. And to see it help someone, especially like my grandmother, being that, you know, I tell people all the time, like, if she's not going to heaven, we're all going to hell for sure. And, you know, you know, I remember kicking my aunts and uncles out the house for smelling like, you know, for reefer, as she called it back then. And, you know, obviously to see, you know, it help her and, you know, her almost testify, crying to my mom, telling about, you know, how bright everything was and, you know, how, you know, how much, you know, she was having relief from her eye pain at that time. It just really just, you know, pushed me into this industry, man. And, you know, I started to educate myself, you know, learned about, you know, all the magnificent things these plants can do, you know, from a health and wellness perspective, helping with kids with epilepsy and seizures and, you know, people with quality of life issues that, you know, suffer from, you know, dying from HIV and cancer and how cannabis actually makes these people lives better. You know, after I learned that, man, it just, it just, I was just like, you know what, you know, I was at my, I was in my 16th year, you know, obviously I could have kept trying to play, but I said, you know what, man, I really want to dive into this and, you know, you know, just see how far I could take this thing and how I could use my platform to change the stigma around cannabis and let people understand like the real opportunities around the industry, but also, you know, how medicinally beneficial this plant is to people. Can you walk us through what it was like to help get your grandmother stoned? How did you administer it? And after she came down, what was her initial reaction? Well, you know, for me, um, I wasn't a smoker at the time when I actually had to try it, right? I had teammates that used. I didn't, but the, you know, what, what made me do it was just, I was reading the newspaper literally like two days before she got there. And the article that I was reading, I guess at that time, you could somewhat make claims and not get in trouble. But the article I read literally said that cannabis cured glaucoma. She got to my house, she took a pill box out, and she started taking all these pills is what prompted me to ask her, like, well, Grandma, why are you taking so much medication? And she started giving me the list of things she was dealing with, and glaucoma was one of those things. So once I told her about cannabis, and I kept, you know, like I said, she looked at me, and she said, well, it sounds interesting. What is cannabis? And I said, it's marijuana weed. And just, she said, reefer? She said, boy, I ain't smoking no reefer. So obviously, you know, at first she was like, you know, hell no. But the next day when I came home from shoot around, she was in pain. And I was just like, look, grandma, you're in a legal state. I said, you're not doing nothing wrong. I told her, I said, it's doctors that prescribe it. So I said, you know, this is what I'll do. I'll have my boy go to the store and bring back whatever they recommend. And he brought back Vietnam Cushion. So to answer your question, what we did was we, vol <laughs> we vaporized it in a volcano because I wasn't a smoker, right? Mm -hmm. And my boy only knew how to roll blunts. And I was like, I don't know if she should smoke a blunt, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> I ended up buying a volcano, one of the volcano uh, things. And that's how she tried it, man. Like she sat in the garage and she smoked out of the volcano bag and, you know, took it downstairs. And like I said, after that moment, you know, I, I had to go get ready for my game. So I wasn't there when she came down. But, you know, all I know is like she didn't want to leave Colorado without it. It, it was a winner for sure. Michael Jordan told a great story in The Last Dance about when he was a rookie walking into one of the hotel rooms and cocaine was obviously the prevalent drug in the 80s with those players and he's like they're all doing blow in there and he just walked right out right how were you able because then weed became the prevalent drug during your era 
how did you keep from smoking when everybody around you is smoking? And then the second part of the question is, what was it like when you finally smoked? Well, it was easy for me not like I didn't drink until like, man, I didn't drink until like maybe my fourth season in the league. Right. And, what I, and my drink of choice was apple martinis. I grew up in a family where like addiction was like a huge issue in my family. Right. And I've had uncles that drank themselves to death. You know what I'm saying? I've had family members that have OD. So I've just always felt and my mom used to always tell me like, boy, you better be, you know, you got to be careful out here because you might have that gene in your body, right? That, you know, I might end up with a, a, a crackhead, right? right? So I was just always just afraid of all of it, man. <laughs> yeah. And you got to think about, I'm from Jersey. So like the war on, you know, the war on drugs and the dare dog and all that kind of stuff. It was just so much negative stuff around cannabis that I was just like, hell no, I didn't want no parts of it. But for for me, the first time I actually smoked was when I was with my team. We were in uh, in Arizona, for, in Phoenix, and I was with Golden State, and we were all sitting, you know, at uh, at Roof Chris watching the game. We need the Clippers to beat the Nuggets so that we would get the uh, eighth spot. And we watching the game. Of course, the Clippers are the Clippers. They lose, so we know that our season's over. So we just got a game tomorrow. It's the last game of the season. So everybody's all frustrated because we just had the We Believe year before that. And, you know, we just we were a better team. We definitely was a better team. But you know, that year I remember we we uh, we bought Chris Webber in <laughs> and tried this experiment for no reason. We bought a washed up Chris Webber in. Chris is my guy, but you know he was washed up at that time. And we put him in the starting lineup, and we lost like seven games in a row. And then we end up missing the playoffs by one game. But that's a whole nother yeah. story. Yeah. But like I said, we all sitting in the room and they just fired up. And they like, Al, you smoking tonight. You ain't got nothing to do tomorrow. We got this bullshit. We got this BS game. And uh, I smoked. And we were supposed to go out that night. But I didn't make it out. Uh, I was so paranoid in my room. Like, I heard, like, the ambulance. I heard sirens. I didn't know what was going on. So... They gave me two stronger products for my first time. So, I <laughs> Do you remember if it was indica or sativa, or I don't. At that point, you were just anyway. It didn't even matter at that time. <laughs> it was too good, whatever they gave me. <laughs> yeah. A few years ago, Jay Williams estimated that eighty percent of the NBA smokes, and your friend Matt Barnes said he was his best games. He was high for. Uh, I'd imagine getting high before traveling is pretty common, giving my own personal preferences. But how common was it to see guys show up to facilities before game after smoking the devil's lettuce, if you will? Never saw it. Never once. It's, it's, it's equivalent of like getting drunk before the game, almost, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, you know, you got to, you know, you're a professional. You're playing against the best players in the world, and you're really about to get high and go out there and be playing like not at full strength. You know what I'm saying? So, like, when you talk to, like, when you hear the stories that Matt and, and, and uh, Steven Jackson tell about, they talk about smoking before the game, but the day of the game, right? Early in the morning. And then, you know, to your point, like, while we smoke before we go on the plane, so we can knock out. So it's the same thing. Like, you know, they have body injuries, different things, maybe, you know, issues away from the court. And, you know, they decide to hit the blunt or hit the weed and, you know, it allows them to relax and go get a good rest and then wake up and feel better and ready to go out there and compete at a high level. So, you know, for me, like, I never had a teammate of mine that actually showed up to the game high to play. Like, I, I never saw that. Al, I'm two years older than you. I was actually on the court with you. At, you were two years younger and you were that dude. Every year there's that dude, the number one player in the country. It's you or Lopez, it was always that one guy. You were that one guy that year. And everybody's like, that's the next big dude. Right. What's it like when you are that national player of the year? Is it like he got game when we see Jesus Shuttlesworth, everybody's coming at him. The women. What's it like when you're in that position? No, nah, you know what? For me, um, no, I didn't get that love, right? I was a late bloomer, right? So I think a lot of those guys are like, you know, their, their hype is built up all the way along the way, right? So by the time they get to high school, like, they are, like, this, like, star, star, right? For me, I was late. Like I said, I, I didn't start playing basketball until I was a freshman in high school. I played at Roselle High School, played on the freshman team, didn't start, barely played. My nickname on the team was Big Daddy. Big Daddy ain't have no game, but Big Daddy was 6'4", so they had me out there. Um, and to this day, like football was always my first love. That's what I always was like really good at. That's what I was just naturally good at, you know, running into people and falling. You know, I still to this day don't know why I chose to go to a basketball school like St. Patrick's and just to lay it all on the line. You know, I was 6'6 when I transferred to St. Pat's. 
Ended up growing to 6'9 by the time I was a junior. And, you know, junior, senior year, we played at that height. For me, it was more of like always trying to catch the guys that was in front of me. So I never had really a lot of time to kind of sit up on the top of the hill and be like, I'm the guy, right? Cause, you know, because I caught everybody my senior year. Going into my senior year, I was like a top 35 pro- pro- uh, prospect. And, you know, after that summer, I was the number one player in the country. So I only had that little bit of time, and then I went to the NBA, where now I'm not the big fish anymore again. You know what I'm saying? I'm right back in that same role of trying to figure out how I can, you know, crack the, uh, you know, crack some playing time. When you piss off Larry Bird, you show up late. Matt, my co-host over here, is a diehard Celtics fan. What happens when you piss Larry Bird off? What's the reaction? Well, it's funny, right? Because you know he got no lips, right? <laughs> so it's hard to tell all of his emotions, right? <laughs> but no, Larry, man, it, it, it was it kind of sucked, right? Just because, like, you know, that's Larry Legend, bro. Like Larry Legend, and um, you know, to have him pissed off at you the very first time you meet really sucks. And I really felt like he really held that against me the whole time. And I'm just like, damn, Larry, I'm a high school kid, bro. Like, it's not like I've been to college. I've never had any of that. And for you to hold that against me, but uh. But uh, he was cool for the most part. You know, what I loved about Larry was uh, he was more of a game manager. He didn't never run X and O's. You know, he just really just subbed guys in and out. You know what I'm saying? That, that was the way, that was his coaching style. And, uh, you know, for me, I didn't get a chance to learn a lot from him just because he's not very vocal. You know what I'm saying? But definitely great to, you know, be able to rub elbows with like someone like him. And also then after that, I had, you know, Isaiah Thomas. So I definitely had some cool coaches. It's amazing. You were so young at that point, entered the league at 18 or whatever, and you didn't smoke, you didn't drink until many. How did you resist that temptation? How did you like acquire that mindset? Like I said, I think just from the way I grew up. And then, like I said, seeing some of my aunts and uncles, some of the issues they had around it, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want that for me. You know what I'm saying? When you see somebody suffering and sick, you know, because of a substance. It's just, you know, it's just, it's hard to see and hard to look at, right? Mm -hmm. But as I've learned, as I'm older now, like the issues that they were dealing with and what they were using wasn't weed, right? (laughs) It was other things, right? Because people that smoke weed don't act the way they were acting, right? So, but, you know, once again, like I said, that's where, you know, where now that's become most like my life's work now is like being able to, you know, change the the stigma on all of that stuff. You got game-winning sneakers and a note of encouragement sent to you by the GOAT, Mr. Michael Jordan. What's it like when that happens? Well, man, I mean, I mean, it's a dream come true, right? You know, that it's like one of those things where, like, uh, I remember when I walked into President Obama's office, and he's like, hey, Al. I'm like, oh, shit, he knows that? He knows me? <laughs> like, it's that moment, right? He's like, damn, Michael Jordan, the GOAT of all. And I mean, I, even though I knew I was on the scouting report and all that, it's just still, like, damn, Michael Jordan is really acknowledging me of all people. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that with him sending me his shoes was just, um, I don't know, it's just like who he was, right? You know, it was like he won the game. We got into a little bit of trash talk and he just told me, you know, keep working hard, best wishes, you know, pretty much saying like, you know, you're not good enough to beat me, but just keep working hard. It's kind of what I, that was the message, the underlying message that I got from him sending me the shoes. But even with that being said, they're sitting in my man cave right now, (laughs) up high, proud. You got to walk me through the Michael Jordan trash talking experience because people didn't understand the mental games that guy played until they saw the last dance. What's it like when you're on the court with him and he's just fucking with your mind the whole time? I mean, it's intense, right? But the good thing about it, like, I didn't catch the Chicago Bull, Michael Jordan. I couldn't imagine that one. Like, you know, I caught Wizards Jordan, which was a lot slower, but he was still damn good, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was just out there. You know, I was young, so, and and I had already been taught before going in the game, was like, you don't talk trash to Michael Jordan, right? So I was very selective in what I said, you know what I'm saying? So he was just doing all the talking, and I was listening for the most part. (laughs) Sir, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it was just like, all right, whatever. And, you know, his favorite word, he called by, as you see on the show, Hope, Hope. What's up, Hope? Come here, Hope. Hope, 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 Hope. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, in our culture, Hope means like a, a B.I., you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's just like, yeah. damn, is he really calling me a B to my face? Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it was it was definitely, um, it was fun, bro. Like, it was Michael Jordan. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm out there with Michael Jordan playing basketball. Like, what more could you ask for?
Is him calling you a hoe the reason why you put LeBron James ahead of him on the GOAT? Uh, do, you st- do you still hold that belief, by the way? Yeah, so well, I, I think what, what I mean by that is, you know, uh, LeBron James is the greatest basketball player, complete basketball player ever, right? Mm-hmm. I still would pick Michael Jordan over him. Like, not, I wouldn't even think twice about that. Um, but everybody else besides that, I would it would be a toss up for me. Michael is the only person that I would one thousand percent pick over over LeBron James. That's it. But from Kobe to Wilt Chamberlain to Shaq and all these other greats, like is a, I got to think about it. You know what I'm saying? I definitely got to weigh weigh my options on those. You live next to Paul Pierce, and he catches a ton of heat as a broadcaster. Ton of heat. Does he know how much heat he's catching? Do you guys talk about this? So if you know Paul Pierce, like that's always been his personality, right? It's almost like he thrives in that and he wants people like to not agree with him, right? He's never going to say the thing that you want to hear. You know what I'm saying? He's never going to, you know, if you say let's go right because right is the right way, he's going to figure out a way to let's go left. You know what I'm saying? It might still end up, he might still end up going right, but he's going to have that conversation. So, and I, and I feel like just for you to have a good sports radio, sports talk, or any kind of show, you got to have somebody on there that just goes, that always is always on the other side of the fence. You know, it's almost like, he's like the Charles Barkley of that ESPN show. You know what I'm saying? But he just don't have, he's just not as good as Charles yet. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like that's kind of his dynamic. It's always to create an argument, create content around like some craziness that he may say. Did he ever give you the inside story on the wheelchair game? Have you guys ever talked about it? No, nah, we don't have to talk about it. I mean, I, I, I know exactly what it is. Yeah, the shit, didn't he? That, it was, he was faking. <laughs> yeah. It, stu- it still doesn't add up, though. It's like, why wouldn't you just go and shit? <laughs> I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I've always been a Paul Pierce fan, but it, something smells fishy, if you will. I mean, come on, bro. I mean, he rolled out of there. But, you know, like, you see Anthony Davis had those. He, had, he did that like eight times in the bubble. You're like, oh, Anthony Davis tore his Achilles. He's done. Oh, my God. And then he's standing on the side. He's stretching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's you know saying, don't forget though don't forget bro we're entertainers too man you I know, know. I gotta keep it <laughs> i know it's just <laughs> who was who was the most annoying player like when you see some of these guys like kyle lowry now is one of those dudes that's always flopping there's a bunch of them who was that dude during your era that you were just like mf or just stop with this shit oh man who was that guy man who was the who was a flopper? There was a lot of flopping going on in the league, man. Like, I mean, I had a great flopper on my team, Reggie Miller. You know what I'm saying? World class flopper. Uh, Rip Hamilton was a flopper a little bit. Uh, who else can I think of that was just? I mean, if you ask me, like the one play I didn't like to play against, I would say it was Zach Randolph. He was no flopper, but he just always kept his body on you the whole game. You just like, Zebo, would you please stop leaning, brother? Like, you're on defense right now. Why are you still on me? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, there's definitely a bunch of floppers. And then you look at the league now, you know, you got some Hall of Fame floppers. <laughs> so they're just getting better and better and better every year, it looks like. You went straight from uh, the league out of high school and had obviously a 16-year career, which I think any player would – dream of having but after 16 years you're still in your early to mid 30s and you're sitting on millions I'm curious like the days following your retirement you know when you know you've hung them up for good what do those days look like are you just like what now no, not for me I had this I had the cannabis business you know what I'm saying so for me like uh it's funny like I, I would say when I first retired man I might travel more than I even did when in the NBA I mean there's times when my wife is look at me and but like dude like are you serious like you said when you were done this was gonna change i haven't had that dull moment but i've definitely had a bunch of other uh homeboys or ex-players that have definitely dealt with this you know what i'm saying like this is a real thing um when you know especially when you play for a long time too because a lot of us never had real jobs we go into this environment into the nba where you know it's millions of dollars around it's all this opportunity it's people constantly reaching and clawing at you for attention and then when you're done playing man it's really almost like the game kind of chews you up and spits you out right so I think that's why a lot of players you know naturally is to try to coach right but there's only so many coaching jobs 
And then it's like, after that, it's like, damn, what real skill set do I have that I actually can really apply myself to on a daily basis that's going to give me that same action or that same enthusiasm that the game did? And it's hard to find that, man. It's hard to find that passion again. And like I said, I've definitely seen a bunch of guys deal with it. And, you know, thank God that, you know, I was able to find a, a, a post-career that, you know, obviously I pretty much consumes more time than it did when I hoop. Because, you know, when I played, Every day, you know, the workout regimen would take anywhere from, you know, three to five hours, depending on if I had to throw rehab in there and all that. Then I had the rest of my day. But now, you know, when you're retired, now you just got a full 24 hours. It's just it's, it's <laughs> a lot different than people not returning your phone calls sometimes and people not responding as fast as they used to. I think it could definitely, you know, affect guys, you know, sometimes mentally. You played for a bunch of different franchises. What was the best experience and what was the worst experience? Um, for me, um, the best experience probably was, I would say it was Indiana. You know what I'm saying? I think that uh, they run a really good organization there, man, across the board, like from the way they treat the players, the way they hold the players accountable and everybody in the organization throughout. Right. I've seen other organizations where that does not happen. And it's really a, you know, a bad situation. You know, you talk about my worst. It would, it would be between two. It would be between Atlanta Hawks and the one year I spent down in Orlando, even though I was hurt. That was just a very, very frustrating year for me during that time. And I would say the Atlanta thing was once it wasn't it wasn't as much as the organization fault. It was more of a personnel issue, meaning that we sucked as play, like not all the players, but most of us. And we had a lot of rookies that, you know, just had no experience. So it was really a scenario where you just, you know, you just really couldn't win. And for me, I had left a, a, a Pacers team that we won 61 games and, you know, lost in the conference finals to the Pistons and went to a team where I won 13 games that next year. So it was a, it was a dramatic drop off and uh, it definitely affected me, you know, during that time. How important is it in a city when, like, you named Orlando, for instance. There's nothing to do in Orlando except, you know, Disney World. How important is it to be in a city, and how much does that factor into your choice where there's nightlife, there's stuff to do? When you're deciding where you're going to end up next, how big a part of the picture is that? I think it's a significant piece, but a lot, I mean, it just depends on, it depends on, like, who you are, like, you know, what player it is, right? Because every, every, there's only, for real, there's only every year, just every free agency, let's just say, there's only three or four players, maybe five, six, that have that luxury, right? Of like, oh, I can sit back and just pick which place I'm, I'm going to go, right? Most times you got to go where they like you. It's almost like with, it's almost like with women, right? <laughs> an, old, an old man told me, like who likes you. It makes it a lot easier, you know what I'm saying? So, I think that that kind of plays in the basketball as well. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by. In New York, uh, you were teammates for a bit with Stefan Marbury, who obviously after the NBA became a god in China, you know, honorary citizen, has a statue outside the stadium, has his own stamps. You spent a few months in China uh, at the end of the, your career. Can you talk about the basketball culture there and just the mindset of having to move 7,000 miles away to a country that you don't speak the language? Yeah, man, for me, man, I, during that time, I learned that all money's not good money, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I was lucky that I actually did pretty good with my money, saved some good money. So, you know, by when I went over there, and it was good money, it was, you know, a couple million dollars to play, tax-free money and all that. Yeah. But just getting over there and, like, laying on beds that was as hard as my desk and getting on planes and the first class not the same. And I couldn't figure out food. I couldn't communicate. Um, so for me, it wasn't a bad experience. Like it was one of those things. I, always, I don't guess I always have this thing. Like when I leave somewhere, I always want to go back. I'm like, damn, it really wasn't that bad. But you know, the one thing I can say about the Chinese, the CBA was that it was very competitive basketball. Um, those guys really play their asses off on a nightly basis. Um, the fans were really good as well. Obviously, you see the way that they support, obviously, the American teams or the you know the United States teams or whatever. So you know that you know they're gonna bring that same energy over there. But uh, you know, for me, I knew when my plane was you know, <laughs> so you know, obviously, there's a lot of smog and all that. So yeah. as I'm flying from Hong Kong into my city, and as I'm flying through the smog, and when I get through and I can finally see the ground and see like the city that I was living in. I knew right then, I said, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> so 
So I ended up being over there 56 days. I ended up playing nine games. And uh, I got back home on Thanksgiving. When I got home, I literally kissed the ground at the airport. I was so happy to be back home. Oh, wow. There's no statues of Al Harrington in, in no. China, I'm guessing. I can't stand all these offshoot leagues that get formed. And yet you played in the big three and Cube has made that an enormous success. How did that happen? How do you end up joining the big three? And at first were you like, I'm not joining one of these stupid offshoot leagues or was it like, this makes sense, let's go for it. Yeah, man, I, um, so Kenya Martin is the reason why I played. I was not thinking about playing any basketball of any sort, right? Um, me and Kenya Martin worked out every morning, you know, together. We had a nice little routine, you know, we did for about two years. And one day um, I had saw him, I, you know, he told me he was going to New York for a press conference. And then, you know, I saw on social media, it was him, Allen Iverson, and Ice Cube. And they were starting this big three league. And when he came back, you know, he started telling me about it. And he was like, yo, you should play. And I was like, nah, I ain't playing, bro. I'm, I'm good, I'm good. And then um, I had another player reach out to me, maybe like Mike Bibby or somebody called me and asked me to play. So, of course, I told Kmart. I was like, yo, um, Bibby called me too, asked me, should I play? And he was just like, well, play whoever you want to play with. And that was his way of like saying, like, if you don't play with me, I ain't fucking with you no more. <laughs> so I was like, all right, forget it, I'll play, bro. So I said, we in shape, you know what I'm saying? We may as well play. So me and him started working out on the court. And we got ready for it. And, you know, we made big three history. You know, first inaugural season, we went undefeated and, uh, you know, won the, the inaugural championship. So, you know, big shout out to Cube for creating a platform for players to continue to, you know, potentially, you know, benefit off of the names that they created off the careers that they had. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that the pandemic don't, you know, shut that thing down for good because I definitely thought it was something that was good for players to be able to participate in that still felt like they could play. Did you bury the hatchet with Charles Oakley on that? I remember he gave you a little, uh, he gave you a little whack to the face, which seemed a little superfluous. Yeah, I talked to Unc, I talked to Unc the other day, man. He in L.A. now shooting, uh, shooting some footage for his cooking show. So, yeah, we all good. Speaking of Bibby, there was a viral picture recently where he was jacked. I mean, he looked bigger than the rock in it. Did you see the picture? And if you did, do you immediately reach out and are you like, Bibby, HGH, what's going on? Oh, yeah, he definitely cheating. But he ain't not going to tell us. But, uh, yeah, he's definitely jacked. Um, Mike's funny, man. Like, you know, a lot of people don't know him personally, obviously. But he is one of the funniest people I know, like, in my life, period. Comedians, like, I will rank him in the top ten of, like, he is so funny. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just surprising because most of his career, he was always skinny. So I was like, all of a sudden, like, why do you want to be big and swole like that? But he makes it work for him. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, Mike is uh, Mike's a good dude, man. There are recent reports of Clipper players kind of rolling their eyes at Kawhi's preferential treatment, you know, load management and whatnot. As a guy who played with stars like Reggie Miller and Carmelo, how prevalent is the star treatment in the NBA? And that, does that cause any resentment among other players or teammates? Yeah, big time. Yeah, hell yeah. You know, especially if, like – I mean, like, if coach, if you're going to give him the treatment, give everybody the treatment. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's the, you know, if he need rest, why well, I don't need rest? I've definitely been on teams like that where we've had, like, you know, stars get some treatment. But normally they'd be, like, they'd be injured. You know what I'm saying? They have, like, an ankle, a shoulder, or whatever. And you kind of got to respect it. And my whole thing, like, you know, the reason why I don't understand why guys get mad about it is, like, number one, if he's not performing, then that's when you'd be upset. Right. But if he's performing for me, like I was a guy that I couldn't not practice and then just go and play in the game. Like I would probably I wouldn't feel confident just because I had a preparation. I had a way that I prepared for games. Right. Mm -hmm. Or in practice, like, I, you know, I would you know want to play one on one or two on two. So I go get the rookies and say, come on, let's go play. You know what I'm saying? So I think that, you know, what, what I've seen is like it seems like the coaches are now taking the attitude of like letting the players decide what they need. You know what I'm saying? To be able to go out there and, you know, produce on a nightly basis. And I think you just need to take that and just be like, all right, cool. Because at the end of the day, like, you need the practices just to stay in shape and stay sharp anyway, right? So why are you – what's the problem? But I get it. That's kind of weird to hear that, especially after the fact. It just seems like they're making all kind of excuses for why they lost. You know what I'm saying? Which uh, is never good. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you just really think about just overall as an athlete – I don't think they wanted to be in the bubble. I think that was the first source of it all. And it showed in their play. 
you know, them, Milwaukee, like even Milwaukee, like they never got to any kind of rhythm. You know what I'm saying? It just they wasn't there. Same thing with the Clippers, and those were the two favorites. And I think that's why you see both of them get knocked off because of that. I want to ask you about Giannis. I've never seen a physical specimen, maybe outside of LeBron, like Giannis. But if you've played basketball, you can obviously analyze where his weaknesses are. And for him, it's really just his jump shot and developing range. Right. When you look at someone like Giannis, can you as a player now say what he's going to become? Is he a guy who ends up winning six rings? Or is this really these limitations? Are they going to keep him back from becoming a LeBron level type success? I don't know, man. That's a good question. I'm not, I can't remember what year he's in. It's, it's too early to draw that, you know, to draw that conclusion on, on, him, on him in his career. If you look at like the way he actually shoots the ball and stuff like that, it's actually, it doesn't look bad. It's not like some way over here. And, and I, you know, and I just think it's one of those things he just got to just tirelessly, endlessly work on it. When you look at the other parts of his skill set, he don't do that much other stuff, right? So it's not like he needs to be sitting and working on all this, you know, because that's not really what he does, right? It's everything is straight to the basket, get long and dunk on you, right? But you got to get that three ball going for people to respect you, especially as you get older, you know? So if I was like, if I worked with him, man, like I would literally make him make anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 jumpers a day. Like I'm saying that will fix you because I was a bad shooter in high school um, my first two years and my AAU coach, he had me make 2,000 jump shots every day for like a three-week period, and that forever changed my, changed my shot. You played with some of the most infamous trash talkers. You played Jordan on the tail end, Kevin Garnett. Who was the guy you played with or against who was most effective in getting guys' heads? And did anyone ever rattle you? No, nope, I, mean, I think it was always Garnett. I think Garnett, yeah, he, had, he has a presence about him. You know what I mean? And he's like huffing and puffing and like... <sighs> it's just like, <laughs> and then, and like if you're a young player, man, you just don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is this? Will he punch me? Like, what's he going to do? So I would just say hands down for me, man. Like, it's nobody that I can think of that had all the antics with the trash talk. You know what I'm saying? It, it was definitely him, hands down. We asked Jalen Rose, toughest cover of his career, and he said Kobe because he guarded him during the 81-point game. So I want to ask you, toughest cover of your career and worst abuse you ever got on the court? Yeah, the worst person that got me was Grant Hill, my first, like, two years in the league when he was in Detroit. He had a lethal first step, lethal. Like, yeah. I'm two feet off him, and he's still one dribble by, right? So... He's the one guy that I still have nightmares about. And then outside of him, like I said, the one person that was tough, well, two people that was tough was always uh, Antoine Jameson because he had that herky-jerky. Oh, yeah. He'd shoot the ball from here. You know what I'm saying? And, and then it was Zach Randolph because Zach just had a motor and he was just physical the entire time. Like you would think he would eventually tire himself out but he didn't. So that just goes to show you the type of motor that he had. And he was just a tough cover, man, like at all times. That dude is a brute for sure. I got to ask you, Al, after the video of Bronny James went viral of him smoking weed, did you see a boost in any of your businesses? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> only, thing I, only thing I saw was belts went, belts went through the roof on the stock market. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that, Al? Because listen, we all know, Players are smoking. Kids are smoking. It's, it's, it's a reality today. So when you look at someone like Bronny, LeBron's a great dad. He was raised in a great support system. Is that a red flag? Are people looking at Bronny and are they worried and should they be worried? Or is it at this point, like, let the kids smoke. He's fine. No, I would never say let the kids smoke, man. I, you know, there's still some studies around, you know, potentially the effects of cannabis on, you know, um, brains being developed you know until a certain age and different things like that so until we have that clarity you know i will never sit and say like that young people should be like smoking or any of that type of stuff but you know when i think about all the other things that Bronny could be doing um and if it's a joint that he'd rather smoke and if that's my son you know what i, I would damn near prefer my son to smoke a joint over drinking liquor like and that's just being all the way on now that knowing what i know now you understand what I'm saying? I would much prefer him to hit a vape 
then go take all kind of shots. And then him and his boys go decide to go jump in the car to go to, you know, go grab a burger. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, from that perspective, you know, um, it's a parenting moment for LeBron and for Bronny. It's obviously, it's something that he likes to do. Um, for the most part, I, I've seen that, you know, he's still very productive. You know what I'm saying? As long as he's taking care of his schoolwork and he's still, you know, working his ass off on the court, trying to be the best player that he can be. You know, I'm not going to sit here, like I said, you know, condone it and say LeBron, Bronny smoked. But, you know, if he is smoking and he feel like, Dad, I need it for X, Y, and Z, I just feel like Bron should have a real conversation with him and just see where his head is for real. What do you think about LeBron remaking Space Jam? I don't know. I mean, he's always saying, like, he's always saying he's trying to get out of the shadow of Michael Jordan. So with that being said, like, why would you go remake the movie that he made? You know what I'm saying? So those are, like, when I just hear, like, when I hear him constantly not wanting to be compared to Mike, but doing stuff like that, it don't really make sense to me. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, I'm looking forward to it. You know, me and my kids will be there supporting and checking the movie out. So I hope he does a good job because, I mean, I grew up on Space Jam, right? So... You know, I'm going to feel some type of way about it, you know, regardless. But, you know, I'm definitely excited to see, you know, how it turns out. All right, Al. We're going to get you out of here uh, on what we like to call a hustle round. I'm going to give okay. you a series of two options, and you're going to say what you personally prefer. Don't take more than three seconds to respond, or it's bad luck for seven years. You ready to go? Oh, shit. Three seconds? Oh, it's, they're quick, though. All right, Cheetos or Doritos? Doritos. Lake or ocean? Lake. Indica or Sativa? Indica. Joints or edibles? Joints. Better fast food, Wendy's or Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A. Better teammate, Reggie Miller or Carmelo Anthony? Reggie Miller. Steam room or sauna? Steam room. Favorite New Jersey native, Whitney Houston or Ice T? Whitney Houston. Big spoon or little spoon? Big spoon. Fun or place to live, California or New York City? Woo! California because of the weather, baby. <laughs> Better basketball movie, He Got Game or Love and Basketball? He Got Game. Better basketball documentary, The Last Dance or Hoop Dreams? Hoop Dreams. Better weed movie, Half Bake or How High? How High. More potential, Luka Doncic or Jason Tatum? Ooh, that hurt. I'm not answering that. <laughs> that's I'm going to go, go, go with, damn, that's a tough one. I mean, Luka's in my top seven and Tatum's in my top ten, so I'll, I'll just put it like that. All right. You got it. I'll, I'll let you out on a technicality. Al Harrington, thank you so much for joining the Endless Hustle podcast. We wish you all well in Viola and future endeavors. Thanks, oh, guys. you were fantastic, man. Thank you. That was yeah. awesome.